Looking at the theme this morning, choosing the right leader. How many of you know there's a couple of months ahead of us, and most people are going to make some kind of choice who's going to lead the country? How many of you know? That's right before us. How many of you know it's important in any area of life that we choose the right people? Amen? How many of you know the wrong person can be destructive? in a family, in a church, in the government. Amen? It's so important that we know how to choose the right, the right leader. Somebody say the right leader. Amen? And I want you to know that prayer is not heard like it used to. How many of you can remember 20, 30 years ago? Some of you can remember back that far. Some of you aren't that old. That a lot of the things that took place were led by prayer. That back our, our forefathers, founding, founding fathers, they would pray first before making decisions. Amen? When the Declaration of Independence was written, they all got on their knees and they would seek God for the right thing to put down. So they would be led by the Spirit of God. But we don't hear those kind of prayers today. But here's a prayer that I believe that needs to be heard. In our land today. We need to get ready to dim those lights, Eric, please. Just this, just these. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternative lifestyle. We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word, Father, and called it pluralism. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have exploited the poor and we've called it the lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Amen. Know us, O God, and search our hearts today and set us free. As I remember four years ago, there was an unrest and an unsettledness all over the land. People were wondering and they were listening. And you know what? I sense some of that in our land today. People were saying, who's going to be the next leader? Who's going to do the right job? Will it affect our future? Will it affect our income? Will it affect my children and my grandchildren? We hear so much talk on TV about who's the right person. How do we know? How do we know who the right leader would be? How do we dare know what guidelines do we have to determine who is the right leader? Some say, I don't know enough about any of them, Pastor. I'm not going to vote for anybody. If that's what we're going to do, then we have no room for complaints when we're not happy. We must... Let our voice be heard. What does God's word say about this? What does God say about the right person? What does God say about a leader that will make the difference and put our country at ease and 
allow us to walk in the principles and the anointing of God. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy and chapter 2. And I apologize, I haven't given the screen people scriptures this morning. Please excuse me and forgive me for that. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. Is anybody with me so far? I'm going to read it again. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications and prayers and intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men. It doesn't say a few. It doesn't say for my favorite. It doesn't say for the ones that I think that's right. It says for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all goodness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God's desire is that we live right and we walk right. It's God's desire that we have peace and we walk in his anointing. Can I hear an amen? amen. Turn with me to a scripture that we all know very, very well. Second Chronicles and chapter 7. Looking at verse 12, and it seems to me like, even as it was back in Solomon's day, we see some unrest and discord in our nation today, and even ungodliness. Second Chronicles 7, verse 12 says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and he said to him, I have heard your prayers. Solomon must have been a leader that took time to pray. Amen? Amen? Solomon took time to pray because God said, I heard your prayers. We must have somebody that knows how to pray. We must have leaders in our churches. We must have leaders in our homes. We must have leaders in our government uh, that would know how to pray and the Lord would hear. Amen? Amen? And I've chosen this place for myself as the house of sacrifice. And when I shut up heaven and there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land and send pestilence among my people. How many of you can see judgment? How many of you can see God will bring judgment on an ungodly people? God is saying there will be judgment on those that won't hear me. There'll be judgment on those that don't include me. There'll be judgment on those that would rather do their own thing than seek my face. But if my people, verse 14, but if my people who are called by my name, how many of you know he's not talking to the world? He's not calling the unbeliever his people. He's not saying to the heathen and the ungodly, pray. He's calling his people to a time of prayer. He's calling his church, his believers, the children of the Most High God, the blood bought, the redeemed of the Lord. Amen? Amen? If my people, the emphasis on my, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Hallelujah. Verse 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to your prayers. Hallelujah. When we pray, with our, when God's people starts to intercede and seek him and, 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 and find the will of God and the anointing of God, we have two months to go before uh, the, one of the most important elections in our country. It's time that God's people would pray and seek his face in behalf of what's going to take place. Can God change things? Yes. Can God move in our behalf? Yes. Will God answer prayers? Yes. Because his eyes will be open and his ears will be attentive to prayer. Made in this place. What place? The house of God. 
made in the place that, that is, that, that's chosen, that's set aside for prayer and seeking him, the house of sacrifice, the house where we would come and seek his face. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house. Oh, hallelujah. I believe this house is sanctified. I believe this house is chosen. I believe God is, is calling people to the house of God, the places that have been set aside for his anointing and his presence. Amen. To seek his face, uh, to, uh, to repent and turn from our wicked ways and, and cry out to God and say, oh God, move and heal. He said, then he'll heal our land. Then he'll hear from heaven. His eyes will be opened and his ears will be attentive because he's chosen He's chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there. Hallelujah. God's desire is for us to walk in his anointing and his presence and put him first and include him on what's going to take place around us. I'm not going to tell anybody who to vote for or mention any person's name in particular. But to see what God's word says about the office of leadership. And such a great opportunity and authority. What does God say about those that are placed in authority over those that are being led? What does God say about great leaders and who they should be? But all through history, our fathers stood on the word of God and they would pray and seek him. This country was founded on in God we trust. This country was founded on the government recognizing uh, that God was a part of everything that took place in government. But if we're not careful, the ungodly will come and take away all the opportunities and shove out the things of God and, and push away the anointing and say prayer must not be a part and, and seeking him and take the commandments off the wall. But I want you to know in 2 Chronicles seven twelve, God does have an opinion. When the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayers. I have chosen this place for myself. As a house of sacrifice. God does have an opinion. And God's opinion does count. Can I hear an amen? amen? In verse 13 it says when we do these things. They, they did the ungodly things. His, he, he, it was, he, heaven was shut up and God didn't uh, hear. And God commanded locusts and, uh, to devour the land. And pestilence to come. But then he said my people can change it. My people can make the difference. My people can change the heart of God. My people can cause things to get turned around and be what God wants it to be. When we do the will of God, God will move in our behalf. How many of you believe that? It's so important to choose the right person. It's so important to seek God as to who he would have in places of leadership. It's so important to seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and know that God will hear from heaven. What are some of the things that we should look for in the next few moments? I'd like to enlighten us for a moment. What are some things that we should look for when it comes to choosing the right leader? I'll tell you some of the things that, that, that shouldn't be uh, the deciding factor. Not just financial comfort. Financial comfort, it seems to be uh, the big thing. Am I going to be okay financially? That should not be the deciding factor. Not just jobs, even though jobs are important. That should not be the deciding factor. Not just tax issues or, or, or particular party issues should not be the deciding factor. Can I hear it? Amen. But moral issues ought to be a deciding factor. Godly values ought to be a deciding factor. Allowing babies to live ought to be a deciding factor. A marriage between a man and a woman ought to be a deciding factor. 
When we line up with God's word, God says, I will hear. I will hear from heaven. When we line up with God's word, God says, I will forgive. When we line up with God's word, God says, I will heal. When we take the deciding factors that really count according to the word of God and make them part of the overall decision when it comes to a leader, God will hear. God chose some leaders. God knows how to choose leaders. God chose Moses to lead the children of Israel out of bondage and into the Canaan land. God chose David, a man after God's own heart. God chose David. Oh, David made a lot of mistakes, Pastor. I know, but so do I. David made some mistakes, but I'm sure you can say, so have you. But he was a man after God's heart. There was something in him uh, that had a passion and love for God. And you can see it in the Psalms as he writes these songs to the Lord and ministers to him. Uh, David had a heart after God. God chose David. You remember when he was chosen to be king, he sent Samuel over to Jesse's house. And he went through all the uh, brothers and uh, all the sons of Jesse. And he said, the, uh, the, uh, the one that God's chosen isn't here. Do you have another son? He said, oh, yeah, just little old David out there. He's, 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 he, he, he's grazing sheep. He doesn't count. Samuel said, bring him. And he poured out the horn of oil and anointed him to be king. God chose Solomon, David's son, to rule over Israel. God will, will choose and he'll put people where they need to be if we'll pray and if we'll seek his face. This Christian life is kind of like an election, by the way. God casts a vote for you and the devil casts a vote for you. Whichever way you cast your vote determines how the election is going to come out. Anybody get that? Turn to Deuteronomy with me. Deuteronomy 28. Everybody's familiar with Deuteronomy 28. We've quoted it and we've read it many times. But Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2 says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently... Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1, if you, it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, and observe carefully all of his commandments which I commanded you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. There's some criteria of obedience uh, that will open up the door for God's favor. Somebody listening to me this evening, this morning. We must walk in the obedience of God. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God. And if you observe carefully all of his commandments that I've commanded you today. That the Lord, your God, will set you on high above all nations. And then it goes on to say, and you'll be blessed coming in. And you'll be blessed going out. And you'll be blessed in the city. And you'll be blessed in the country. And all that you put your hands to shall be blessed. But it starts with obedience. Our forefathers stood on the word of God. This is why we, the United States, has been, been above all the nations for years and years. But things are different today. We don't have, uh, we, we don't see the desire to press in and hear God's voice. Uh, we, don't, hey, we, we don't hear those uh, that are in authority crying out for the anointing of God. Uh, we don't hear reports that they spend their time on their knees day and night to get a word from God that they might walk diligently before him to receive the blessing. We need God today. We need to heal today. We need to repent today. I believe there needs to be some healing in our land. I believe there needs to be some repentance, crying out, say, oh God, oh Lord, I've missed you. I've, I've set you aside. I've, I've, taken, I've taken you out of the schools. We've taken you out of the places of authority. And we need to cry out and repent and say, oh God, I need you desperate more than I've ever needed you before. How can we turn? How can we turn this around? How can we make a difference? 
2 Chronicles 7, 14, here's how we do it. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. I appreciate that prayer uh, that Tian read this morning. That was the prayer that one of our politicians years ago, back in the early 60s, he was asked to be a, a general speaker and, 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 and to pray over one of the political, what, what are the, uh, political events. And he started it by praying this prayer. And as he prayed this prayer, it was so, it, it was so uh, uh, offensive to many of the people who were there. They got up one at a time and walked out. Because he said uh, the truth. And when you find the truth, the truth will set you free. And he said, uh, the, 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 and the prayer speaks what's going on in many areas of our land today. How can we turn it around, Pastor? We can turn around by seeking his face in prayer. We can turn around by coming in agreement. We can turn around by understanding what the word says in regards to godliness and holiness. And I'm going to go quickly, Proverbs 15. I'm sorry, Proverbs 14 and verse 34. Proverbs 14 and verse 34. It simply says this, righteousness exalts a nation. I said right standing exalts a nation. What is righteousness? It's right standing with God. When we're right standing with God, a nation is elevated. When we're not right standing with God, a nation falls. History tells us that many, many nations started out in godliness and started out right, but when they lost focus on who God was, the nation itself fell. Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to all people. A country is only as strong as its leader. A country is only as strong as those that would lead, whether they're either going to lead in godliness or they're going to lead in worldliness. Uh, the strength of a country is based on the strength and the godliness of a leader. This nation must come back to God, church. Ezekiel chapter 3, you don't have, to, don't have to turn there, but in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16 through 21, God assigns Ezekiel to stand in the gap. He assigns Ezekiel to stand on the wall as a watchman on the wall. And he said, I want you to place you on the wall to be a watchman. Because if you watch over those and you shout the, uh, the warning and you tell those that are in sin uh, to repent and they repent, uh, then uh, the credit is on your hands. But if you don't shout and you don't sound the warning and you don't tell them and they die in their sin, uh, you, the responsibility will be on your soul. Amen. What a responsibility that was placed on Ezekiel and what a responsibility is placed on the church today. I'd rather shout the warning and not be heard than to never have shouted the warning. I'd rather somebody walk out and say I disagree and know that I've, uh, I've, th th that I've, I've been obedient to God uh, than trying to make friends with everybody and, and find myself being compromised in the things of God. If there was ever a time to fast and pray, it's now until the time we vote. There was ever a time to press in and seek God and say, God, we need godly leaders. And we need you to guide and direct this nation. In Joshua chapter 1, it said, um, God said, my servant Moses is dead. Moses uh, was the God man. Moses was uh, the, the leader at that particular time. Moses was the one that God chose uh, to lead Israel to a certain point. But then there came a time Moses couldn't take them where they needed to go. And Moses died outside of Canaan. And God said uh, to Joshua, uh, the, uh, the armor bearer and the leader and the associate and the one that would, uh, the, the one was faithful to Moses in all of his ways, the one that had Moses' heart. Everybody doesn't have a leader's heart. When it came time for Moses to go to the mountain and get the commandments, there was only one that posted himself at the foot of the mountain and stayed there until the leader came down because he was committed to him. The rest of them were down in the valley melting down gold and making a calf and something to worship because they was tired of waiting. 
But when it came time, God spoke to Joshua and he said, Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now you take these people and lead them into the promised land. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 21 and 23, God removes kings and he raises kings. Whenever Israel was put in exile because of their own disobedience, they was put under the king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was an ungodly man that built an idol to himself. But there was three Hebrew children that wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, and they wouldn't burn. God's looking for men and women today that'll be like the three Hebrew children. God's looking for men that'll be like Daniel that get in his face every day and look out the window towards Jerusalem and pray even when he's told, don't you ever pray again. Because Daniel would pray, they threw him into the lion's den and in the middle of the night, God shut up the lions, praise God. Because when a man's willing to make a stand for what he believes in, or we're willing to, uh, to walk in the anointing of God, uh, you'll find that God will bring you through and he'll see you through in the midst of a heathen and an ungodly circumstance. God removes kings and he raises up kings. It's up to us to make sure we do our part. Daniel was in a place of government. He knew where his strength came from. It came from God. What should we look for, Pastor, when it comes time to, uh, to bring in a new leader? Uh, what should we look for? Here's some of the things we should look for. Are you ready? Can I have another five minutes? Does he or she stand and believe in the Word of God? Does he or she believe God's Word is the ultimate, is the ultimate Word for life? Number two, does he or she believe in prayer? Do they seek the face of God and know that God is the answer and God will intervene? Number three, does he or she believe and respect the judgments of God? Oh, we can say I believe God and we can say I'm a Christian and I can even, I, I can even say I'm born again. Do you know the, uh, the, uh, the movie stars are all saying they're born again? Everybody's born again. Now, that's just a, a nice little phrase. It really fits good. But they, do they pray? Do they believe in God's word? Do they understand the judgment of God and know that God is the ultimate answer in every circumstance? In Exodus chapter 18 and verse 13, Moses was a leader. He was the prime minister if you would be in the, in the Caribbean. He'd be the president if you'd be in the, this country. And if you was back in Moses' days, he was the God man. God will raise up men to be righteous. God will bring in the right people. What are we looking for, Pastor, for the right man? Do they make known the statutes of God and make known his law? Or do we take the commandments and throw them out? Or do we alter what we want because other things put us under conviction and it doesn't fit our society? Do we understand his statutes and his ways? When a leader is chosen, they must be men that fear God. They must be men of truth. They must be men of conviction. Choose this day who will be the person that will ask God to bring and touch. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4 through 8. Does the person that we're going to choose to be a leader, does he believe that life is in the womb before the baby is formed? God said to Jeremiah, I've formed you. I've known you before you was formed in the womb. That means that conception there was life. And that life needs to be respected and honored. That life is real. Every child that comes into the world has a purpose, an anointing from God. Amen. We must protect that purpose. We must protect that anointing. And whoever chooses to lead must recognize uh, that this is a God thing, not a man thing. Amen. Then number six, does he believe that sodomy and homosexuality and lesbianism is an abomination to God? 
according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 22. This isn't a game we're playing. This isn't some little thing that, uh, that, uh, that's a matter of somebody's opinion. Is somebody with me? Look at Romans chapter 1 uh, for a moment, and I'm going to read this to you. People profess, it's when people profess to be wise and become fools and change the glory, of in, uh, the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible men. Therefore God also gave them over to uncleanliness in the lust of their own hearts by dishonoring their bodies among, the, uh, among others, among themselves who exchanged the truth, for, uh, the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them over to vile passions for even the women exchanging the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of a woman and burning in their lust for one another. Oh, listen. It's pretty clear to me. It's pretty clear to me what God feels. And, 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 and we, need to, uh, we, need, we need to know that God wants leaders that will say enough is enough. Yeah. The word of God is true regardless of what popularity says. Regardless of what the groups want to say. Regardless of how many people say it's okay. It's not okay. And then number seven. Does he believe, does a leader believe that marriage is between a man and a woman? Not Adam and, uh, not Adam and Steve or Jane and Eve. Amen? Amen. Marriage, is, marriage is between a man and a woman. Amen. Why is that so important? It's because the marriage is a small scale of Jesus and the church. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wife, even as Jesus loves the church and gave himself for her. It's the model of the church to the world. It must stay pure and holy. And then does the believer or does the leader we're going to choose, does he believe in being single-minded and resolute? According to James chapter 1, 6, Eight, it says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We need to be stable in our thinking. I'm almost done. If we're going to choose a leader, does he believe in the family unit? And it's the very bedrock of the nation. The family was first established before the church. It was in the beginning in Genesis that God said it's not good for man to be alone. So he created a woman for him. And he called him his wife. And he said, a man must leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. And she cleaved her husband. Because the family unit is, the unit is the very foundation of God's word. God's word is based on family. And then number 10 in closing. Does the leader we're going to choose, does he believe in putting Christ first in every area of his life? Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. Uh, it says, if you then be risen with Christ, then seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God. It's Jesus first. Matthew 6, 33 uh, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto us. Oh, listen, church. We got a big job ahead of us in the next couple of months. And I'm going to ask you to pray like you've never prayed before. I'm going to ask you to intercede and seek God. If my people will humble themselves, be humble in his presence. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I heal their land. Turn from our wicked ways. Why is he saying wicked ways to the believer? Because our wicked way many times is just doing nothing. Many times the Christians, it's not we're involved in the sin of the world. It's we're not involved in seeking God and, and believing God for the miracles that's needed. So I'm going to ask you as a body, and I'm going to commit myself with you, that we need to pray like we've never prayed before. That these ten principles, these ten criteria that I just gave you, will be the criteria of the leaders that will lead our country.
lead our homes, lead our churches, and the power of God will once again rise to the top. And this country once again can be the country above every other nation because it's a godly country. Anybody received anything out of this this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Every, every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. Thank you for the extra few moments to finish this message. I thought it was vitally important. I'm challenging you, church. I'm challenging you. I'm challenging myself. Let's pray in. Let's pray in the godly leaders in our land that will lead according to his mighty word. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, those principles are great, but I'm not even living in those principles or walking in them myself. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. Maybe you came in here today and you're really not born again. This can... This, this morning can make it, can change the rest of your life. This could be the greatest day in your life. How do I know I'm saved, Pastor? By answering this question, if you would die tonight, God forbid, but if you would die tonight, do you know that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know you got a home in heaven? Do you know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a child of God? If you can't say yes to that, this pastor would be honored to pray for you. The second question. Are you one of us? I say us because I was there at one time. You got wounded in the church. You got hurt. You used to serve God, but you wasn't appreciated. You had some people put you down when you tried to do your best. And you said, this is Christianity. I don't need it. Even though you're saved and you know if you, you, know, if you die tonight, you, you would go to heaven. You backed away from the things of God because you got hurt and wounded. Is God crying out to you saying, my son, my daughter, let me heal you. Would you come home? Let me restore you back to where you used to be. I got a place for you to serve. Don't be on the bench. Get in the game. Let me heal you and restore you. Maybe you need a healing from the Lord this morning. If you're here and you meet either one of those categories, you need to be born again or you need God to restore and heal you. It'd be my privilege to pray for you. Would you just lift your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me. Is anybody here? You need to have God just heal you and touch you. Maybe you need to be born again. You need to come to him. If that's you, raise your hand so I can pray for you. Is there one? And I'm believing everybody in this house has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you're ready for heaven. Will you stand with me, please? The elders come to the altar just in case somebody needs a touch before we close. I know this sermon wasn't the kind of sermon that you know you'd run and shout and say hallelujah, glory, glory. But I hope it's the kind of sermon that sunk into our hearts. And that we as believers were stirred up to know the difference between a godly leader and an ungodly leader. And that we can make the difference. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe we can make the difference? If my people will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. Then I will heal their land. Then I will forgive. Hallelujah be dismissed in a minute sing this with me if there's anybody that needs special prayer here's what I, here's what I'd like to see listen here's what I'd like to see for a moment the elders are here for prayer I like some people right now to think of some different people that needs prayer in government maybe it's our law enforcement maybe it's our president Maybe it's the people that are running for president. I like to see some come and just stand in the gap for them and say, I'm here. Would you agree with me that, that our law enforcement people will be safe? I want to pray for them. Maybe you'll want to step up and mention somebody by name that's on your heart in government. What's wrong with us praying for the people in authority? What's wrong with that? 
All authority is given to God. And I wonder sometimes that, our, that, that people are in the condition they're in because we're not praying for them. How many of you, how many of you can see that? How many of you can see that? As we sing this song, and if, there's, if the Lord lays it on your heart for somebody particular to pray for, will you come and ask them to pray? Hallelujah. Let's sing this. If my people call by my name, humble themselves and pray. If they seek my face and turn from their sin, and I will heal, and I will forgive. I will heal their land. Now these are serious prayers for our government. I would like to have you all reach out in agreement in prayer. Reach your hand if you believe God is going to touch and heal you and you believe there's a need for prayer. Would you reach out and pray? And then let's sing this together. Every believer lift up your voice as we sing this incredible scripture. And I believe God will honor it. Sing it again. If my people called by my name humble themselves and pray, if they seek my face and turn from their sin, and I will hear, and I will forgive, and I will heal their land if my people call them my name humble themselves and pray if they seek my face and turn from their sin then I will hear and I will forgive I will heal their land one more time if my people call by my name will humble themselves and pray if they seek my face and turn from their sin then I will heal and I will forgive, and I will heal their land. Thank you, Father. Lord, we lift up these prayer needs to you, those that are lifting up some of the, maybe some of the most critical prayers in our time. Lord, there's a time that we pray for one another. We lift up our needs, but God, we're using this moment to lift up those in authority over us. Lord, from the law enforcement people to the president. And we know, God, that you said all authority, all authority has been placed there by you. And all authority you have in your hand. And God, we ask in Jesus' name, as we seek your face and we pray in these next few months, the Lord will see it turn around. We'll see the anointing of God move like you did in the days of Solomon when the land was corrupt, rebellious, judgment upon it. But you said if your people will humble themselves and pray. So Lord, we commit to a time of prayer and seeking your face that you'll heal our land. Heal our land. Lord, heal our land. Heal this land, oh God. We're desperate for a healing. Some of us, Lord God, we are desperate because we got our future in front of us. Some of, our, of, of us are desperate for a healing because our children stand behind us. Some of us are desperate for a healing because our grandchildren need the best country in the world to live in. Help us, oh God. Heal our land. Heal our land. Thank you for this wonderful congregation. I thank you for your people. 
and have ears to hear and to receive your word. Bless them in a mighty way this afternoon. Bless them as they go and get rest. Bring us back at 6 o'clock in the gymnasium that we can have a time of fellowship and a time of joy and we can magnify your name. But Lord, bless your people coming in and going out. Bless them in the country. Bless them in the city. All that they put their hands to. I speak a blessing on them in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Turn around and tell somebody they're special and you're dismissed.